All right, let's get started. Um, I got to get used to not having a sign-in sheet. I'm like, first thing I want to do is give you the sign-in sheet. <laughs> I'm scared to get it back. <laughs> It's abstract. All right, all right, all right, all right. Let's settle down, settle down. Okay, so um, we are in 1103. Um, we had a couple scheduling sort of quirks in the background uh, after last time, but it looks like everything has been resolved, and we are in this room from here on out. And um, uh, that's really nice, especially for uh, the folks that have steel in an hour and the professor that has steel in an hour, because then I don't have to redo this setup again. So, also today's gonna be my first day where I break out the, like this new, uh, using OneNote for the, um, uh, for the problem, so we'll see how that goes. So, forgive me if it uh, gets a little wonky on me, but it's my first time using OneNote for in-class examples. Okay, um, just a few quick announcements. Again, uh, this is pretty much the same as last time. Class is going to be canceled next Wednesday. I am not going to be in West Virginia, at least for the first part of the day. I'm flying back. Uh, so I'll be on a plane uh, during this class, so obviously we won't have class. And then the first homework assignment is going to be assigned on Friday. It will be due not Monday, but the following Monday. Um, and uh, it's a pretty straightforward assignment. It's not very long. Um, so, but we'll, you'll, you'll kind of get an idea of what's going to be on that homework assignment after today. Um, last time I did a lot of talking, so today we're going to get to doing. We're going to do a, a, a tributary area example, and then we're going to talk about some things about live loads and live load reduction uh, and what have you. So with that, I'm going to um, just sort of get into it. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. In show. And I want to get to this. All right, there we go. Okay, so last time, if you recall, what we were really trying to do was set the stage for this, which was our design philosophy. So last time, we talked about um, what it is that we as structural engineers are trying to do. Uh, I mean, I know that seems like a really basic question. I mean, obviously, we're trying to design structures, but what does that mean? And so uh, I think we kind of clarified that a little bit last time. I know it, it might have gotten a little statistics heavy, but it, again, what we were trying to do is recognize that our fundamental goal is to design systems such that the resistances are greater than the loads. Now, we're going to be applying a series of load factors and resistance factors in order to um, account for uncertainties and to ensure uniform levels of safety. Uh, but before we get there, I kind of want to take a step back and talk about loads. So really for the entirety of the semester, for the, the, the vast majority of the semester, we're going to be talking about resistances and, and specifically how to design beams, columns, slabs, what have you, uh, in order to achieve a resistance greater than the loads. But I do need to spend some time talking a little bit about loads uh, in here so that you're aware of what's going on. And if you remember, in here, we're going to talk about gravity loads, and then in steel design, we'll talk about lateral loads, so you'll kind of get the, the complete picture between the two courses. Now, um, we're talking about uh, uh, gravity loads in here, so we're talking about dead loads, live loads, snow loads, anything that acts up and down. And in order to uh, assess those loads, and in order to perform structural analysis, we need to understand tributary area. And tributary area, uh, again, uh, or the tributary width is, is pretty much uh, it de is defined as the area uh, for which a given element is responsible for. So if you have a floor beam and a floor system, how much of that floor is that beam responsible for? And that's tributary area. And we basically uh, define it as halfway between uh, adjacent beams uh, and whatnot. Okay. So uh, we, we went through an example sort of conceptually where we took a floor system and we said, okay, let's draw out the tributary area and how can we transfer those loads uh, from system to system and whatnot. And uh, uh, we did that conceptually, but today we're going to sort of roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty uh, a little bit. Uh, and then I showed you this example from the Third Avenue parking garage looking at, at how loads are distributed. Let's sort of just get into it. I, I, I'm, I'm sort of itching to, to actually do some calcs. 
So what I have here is I have a floor uh, plan, and I'm going to show you the floor plan on the next slide. But what we're going to say is this floor system is subjected to a distributed load of 20 pounds per square foot. Okay? So, you know, let's say I have a room, you know, like this, and the entire floor is subjected, every square foot is subjected to 20 pounds. Okay? And when designing building systems, it is very, very common for your loads to be delineated uh, like that. So, for instance, when we talk about live loads, your live loads change depending upon the type of structure that you're designing. So, the live loads for hotels are different than the live loads for offices or for hospitals or what have you. And they're typically expressed in pounds per square foot. And we'll, we'll get into that here in a little bit. So, um, but what we're going to do is we're going to do an example looking at uh, uh, a given floor system. And I want to know what the tributary area uh, uh, is for the following elements. I've got a typical interior floor beam, uh, C2, D2, uh, which is one of the girders, and then column B2. And I want to determine what's the load on an interior beam, what are the concentrated loads on a given girder, and uh, what are the axial loads uh, on that column. So we'll actually try and take this floor plan, and ultimately what we're trying to do is turn this into a CE312 problem, into a structural analysis problem that we're all quite familiar with, okay? And I think you'll see how we do that uh, quite easily, okay? Now, here's the floor plan. Uh, I have this uh, in the handouts as well, so, um, so just again to make sure everybody knows what they're talk or what we're looking at. So we're looking at a building that uh, has four columns by four columns. So each of these black squares are columns. So again, imagine me sort of in the helicopter looking down. So I see these columns sticking out of the ground. So I have, um, you know, co the column line A, column line B, column line C, column line D. So for instance, if I'm looking at girder C2, D2, I'm talking about this girder right here. That's the girder I'm talking about. If I'm talking about column B2, I'm talking about this one. Okay? Any typical interior floor beam, I can just you know, look at that one or any one random one. And what we're going to try and do is take this 20 pounds per square foot load and say, okay, what's going on? How can we turn this into a structural analysis problem? So uh, everybody good with that? Yes, sir. The five and 10 have five girders. For, Five beams, five beams. So what, what, that's a good question. What I'm saying is that from here to here, so like from line A to line B, that that distance is 50 feet. And so if you look, let me see if I can draw this right here. So what I'm saying is that's 10 feet. That's 10 feet. And so 10, 10, 10, that's how I get 50. That's a good question. So, yes? Inter what do you mean intermediate? That's a good question, and generally no. Um, the only reason I would say yes is if you have a floor plan that's rather complicated, but usually you're calling those out with a good reference anyways. So um, a, a good example is if you have a building that's not grid-like, which happens quite a bit, you have beams that are, you know, bays that are going all over the place, uh, if, if you have a particular beam that needs its own name, you'll give it its own name as the structural engineer. You say, okay, here's this, this uh, floor plan, and the client and the architect have a really weird bay right here, so we're going to call that beam, you know, 2-6 or, or what have you, because we got to pay attention to that one. So, but a regular old interior floor beam, no. Because the idea is this. If you can design this interior floor beam, they're all the same because they're all going to be subjected to the same loads. And whenever you have something that's subjected to a different load, then you'd have to deal with it. So. That's a good question. Any other questions? This is good stuff. OK. All right. So with that, let me Sorry, I just think that's cool. OK. So um, here I've got uh, my notebook pulled up, and I went ahead and, and put in an example of the floor uh, plan just so everybody could kind of see what we're talking about. And what we're going to do is, let me blow this up a little bit. Okay. Okay. So let's just start off and draw out some tributary areas. Now remind me, we had girder C2D2, is that what it was? There was column B2, and then just a regular old interior floor beam. So let, let's take care of the interior floor beam first. Let's just take it in order, okay? So 
if, if I have a floor beam, and let's say I'm looking at this particular uh, beam, let's see, ah, the mouse isn't working. Let's say I'm looking at, at this floor beam right here, at this one right here. I propose that the tributary area for this floor beam is halfway over to the next one and halfway over to the next one, right? So I would propose that that tributary area looks something about like that. So that would be the tributary area for a typical interior floor beam. The only floor beams that would be any different would be the ones on the outside, the ones uh, on, let's say, lines A and line D. Okay? One other um, uh, piece of terminology uh, from structural engineering lingo is the term bay, B-A-Y. I would say that this building is three bays by three bays because I have, you know, between A and B, that's a bay. Between B and C, that's a bay. Between C and D, that's a bay. So if you ever hear the term bays, that's what we're talking about. Sound good? All right. Now, C2, D2, um, so you know, we're talking about this girder right here. So again, halfway over to the next one, halfway over to the next one. I propose that that tributary area would look something like this. Sound good? Be okay with that? And then the last one was the column B2. So again, you're looking at the columns in this instance, so you go halfway over to the next adjacent column. So, you know, we're talking basically like halfway here and halfway there and so on and so forth. So that tributary area is going to look like this. Sound good? All right. Any questions? Yes, yes. So this is going to be, you know, column B2. This is girder C2, D2. And this is just floor beam. Can you read that? Just floor beam and then girder and then column. Sound good? Okay. Now, I want to do some calcs. I want to do some math on this. Okay. So let's start off with the floor beam. Okay. And I'll introduce you to some notation. Okay. Can everybody read that? Is that big enough? Okay. All right. So first off, how long is the floor beam? 30 feet. Okay. Now, um, how, now I'm going to introduce you to a, a term now. We're going to call this W sub T. Okay. Now, W sub T is going to stand for the tributary width. Okay. So how wide of a floor width is this uh, beam responsible for? But I guess the, uh, another way of looking at that here, let me put some dimensions on this. What we're talking about is essentially this dimension there, that that's the tributary width. Can anybody tell me what the tributary width is? It's 10 feet. There we go. So, so from these, we could say that the tributary area is what? 300 square feet. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you, right now, we're not directly going to use the tributary area, but you're going to see where the tributary area uh, comes in here in a quick second. All right. Sound good? Okay. Now, here's what's going to happen uh, for, for tributary area. And please forgive my, uh, my art skills, but this is going to get a little three-dimensional. So 
what we've got going on is we've got a, a floor system, right? So we've got like a slab and then a series of beams spaced every, what, 10 feet apart? So since this is a reinforced concrete system, it might look something like this. We might have, you know, here's the slab, then we've got that, 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 you know, something like that, okay? And that floor system is going on, you know, it's going on like this, so it's going on in three dimensions, right? Okay? Now, what's happening is that floor system is being subjected to a, a, a pressure load, to a, to a, you know, a distributed pressure load, something like this. So it's seeing a pressure load all across it. So again, please forgive my, uh, my 3D art skills. I know they're horrible. Something about like that, right? So it's a pressure load across the entire floor system. And so for this floor beam, what we're doing is if all we're interested in is looking at this particular floor beam right here, well, I propose that that floor beam is going to be responsible for only that much of the load, only this much load right here. Does that make sense? Again, for, forgive my artwork. That's, I know that's pretty bad. So far, so good? Now, remind me, what is this dimension right here? What is that tributary width? Ten feet. Okay, so this dimension is ten feet. And that pressure load was what? It was 20 pounds per square foot? That's what it was for this problem? What I'm proposing is this. We have, I mean, this is a 3D system, right? We have beams going this way, we have beams going this way, and then we have, you know, the z-axis, we have gravity. What I want to do is I want to collapse this into a two-dimensional system. And so I'm saying, this is how I'm going to handle this. If I have a beam that's being subjected to 20 pounds per square foot over a width of 10 feet, what I can do is this. I can say, you know what? Why don't I idealize this as a single beam instead of uh, uh, seeing a pressure load, maybe it should only see a line load. Now how much do you think that line load is going to be? What's that? Not, nah, you, you think of it backwards, Th think about it like this, it's 20 pounds per square foot applied over 10 feet. So it's not two, it's it's 200. Think, if, if I'm, see what I mean? If I have 20 pounds per square foot and I'm responsible for 10 feet, that beam is holding up 200 pounds per foot. Make sense? So this beam is seeing 200 pounds per foot. Now, remind me, how long did you say this beam was? 30 feet? Therefore,
What do you think? I have a beam that's 30 foot long that's being subjected to a uniformly distributed load of 200 pounds per foot, right? Now that turns a rather complicated three-dimensional structural system into that, okay? If you don't recognize that type of problem, then I just abjectly failed teaching you structural analysis last semester. That should be a very basic fundamental problem, right? A simply supported beam subjected to a uniformly distributed load. Just for the sake of discussion, what are those support reactions? 3,000 pounds, right? Because how much is the beam subjected to? Well, it's subjected to 200 pounds per foot over a distance of 30 feet, right? And I can collapse that into a single point load of 6,000 pounds right in the middle, so 3,000 pounds and 3,000 pounds, right? Not too bad, right? So I propose then, and I'm calling it RB, just so your reaction of the beam, so that everybody knows what I'm talking about. So therefore, RB is 200 pounds per foot times 30 feet over 2, oh, which is 3,000 pounds or three kips, I mean, if you prefer kips, either one's fine. Yes? That's a great question. That, that's an excellent question. The question was, how did I know if it was going to be a pin or a roller? That's an excellent question. In beam land, when you're analyzing beams, really we only care about two types of support conditions. Simple supports, or fixed supports, okay? Simple supports are either hinges or rollers, and fixed supports are ones where it's rigid, where it resists moment. Um, first off, when in doubt, if you're estimating moments, or, you know, sure, something like that, when in doubt, always assume simple supports because it generates larger moments. Remember at the end of structural analysis when we talked about indeterminacy, one of the things we said about indeterminacy is that you get lower moments, okay? So that's point one. Point two, um, fixed connections, just by their very nature, and this is true whether or not you're talking about concrete or steel, they generally are more expensive. Okay? Um, if you remember in steel design, we talked about uh, 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 lateral loads, and we talked about brace frames and moment frames. Generally, you're only going to use fixed connections. This is a general statement. This isn't always. But you're generally only going to use fixed connections whenever you're looking at your lateral system. Regular old everyday floor beams in the building are going to be simply supported just about any time, just because it's simple. You know, you're just taking it, dropping it in, and there you go. Think, of, think about the Third Avenue garage. Those ends weren't encased. They were just, here's the girder, set them down, that's it. So those ends are going to rotate freely. Does that make sense? Everybody else okay with that? This is good stuff. This is a good question. Any questions? All right. Now, okay, so, I mean, go, first off, if you go back to the example, what's the example asking about in regards to the floor beams? It's asking for, uh, you know, what's the tributary area, but then it's asking for what's the distributed load on the floor beam? Well, it's the 200 pounds per foot. That's pretty easy, right? Now, what's the next thing it asks for for the loads? What's it say? I want to read this out. It says the distributed load on the floor beam, but what else? The concentrated loads on girder C2, D2. Okay, let, let's, let's think about that. Okay, now let's go back to the floor system. Okay, now I want to talk about that girder because there's two different ways I could go about analyzing that girder. And I, and I want to look at each one, okay? So I propose that with that girder, there are two ways of going about it. The first is to treat that girder exactly like you would a floor beam. What is the tributary width of that girder? The tributary width. 30 feet. This distance is 30 feet, okay? So I want to just make a point with this, okay? So girder. Girder analysis. Method one, 
use tributary area. Again, let me know if the handwriting's bad. Again, it, the new, new method, it's a little different. Now we have a tributary width of 30 feet. And what is the length? Say it again, 50 feet. So therefore, We have that. What is that load going to be? It's 20 pounds per square foot over a distance of 30 feet. What is that? Say it again. Not 600. Oh, wait. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Sorry. I was thinking 6,000. I'm thinking ahead. Forgive me. I didn't box it. I didn't box it. Yes. That's a great question. How long is the beam? The length of the beam is 50 feet, or the girder is 50 feet. But the load is applied over that width of 30 feet. Think about, think about it like this. The beam, or the girder, is going this way. So you multiply it by the transverse width, the width this way, just like the beam here was going up and down. So the width was that way. Ah, that's a great question. Make sense? All right. Now, that is one way to analyze the girder. Okay? That is one way. I want to show you another way to analyze the girder. And honestly, more often than not, the, the second method is the method I prefer. Okay? The second method. is to use the beam reactions. Okay. Now, the second method I like a little better because the second method adheres to the principles of statics a little bit better. Um, in other words, you're not double counting load. This upper method, this method number one, you are sort of double counting load a little bit. Doesn't really matter, but it can in some instances. Um, here's what I propose with, with method two. So we have a reaction here. We have a reaction here. And this dimension is still 50 feet. Okay. Let's scroll up a little bit. Now here's the floor plan, and I'm going to look at this girder here, this C3, D3, because they're both the same. But if you look at this girder, remember, it's sort of like hip bone connected to the leg bone. The beams frame into the girders, the girders frame into the columns, the columns go down to the ground, right? So think about this floor beam. This floor beam you know, it's, it's sitting up there in the frame, right? And what are the reactions? What are the reactions of that floor beam again? 3,000 pounds or three kips, right? Does that three kips just float up in, in the air? The three kips has to go somewhere, right? And so I think hip bone connected to the leg bone. I propose that those three kips, they go to the girder. And then a reaction from the girder goes to the column. And then the reaction from the column goes to the ground. So think, here's a girder. How many times do floor beams frame into it? One, two, three, four, right? Four. What? Well, well, let's, hold on. Wait, hold on for a sec. Hold on for a sec. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. 
This is what I propose. I propose that we're going to have one, two, three, four point loads on that beam. Okay? Now, how much are each of those point loads going to be? Are they going to be three kips? Hold on. They're framing in from either side. So they're going to be six kips. So you were getting ahead of yourself because you were trying to compute the reactions at the end. And I say, hold on, define the model, then say, okay, let, let's get the reactions and shear diagram, moment diagram, et cetera. Yes? But, okay, that's a great question. The reason is because if, if let's say I'm looking at that girder right there, okay, let's, let's take this point. There's a beam framing in here. But then there's also a beam framing in there. So there's two beams framing in from either side. So I got three. So think, here's the girder. I got three kips coming in here, three kips coming in there. So at that point, I'm seeing six kips. Does that make sense? This, good stuff, this is important. So I want to make sure everybody's clear on this. Everybody okay with this? That's a great question. Um, and I'm, I'm going to address that here in a second when we look at the columns. I propose that those loads just go straight to the column. And you're going to see how that works out here in a second. Okay? Is everybody okay with this? All right. So right off the bat, we agree that those point loads are 2 times 3 kips, which are 6 kips. What's the reaction for the girder for this method? It's 12 kips, right? Because think, what's the entire beam saying? If these each are 6, 6, 12, 18, 24 going down, so 12 and 12 going up. And I think that's what you were saying, right? You were get, you, I mean, you were right. We were just getting a little ahead. So this is... 12 kits. Does anybody have any questions on that? Now, I'm curious, what would the reaction be for method one? Does anybody know what the reaction would be for method number one? So, say it again. 15,000 pounds or 15 kips. So the reaction with method number one comes out a little higher. Exactly right. It's because it's counting those beams that go into the columns. Okay, So it's double counting in a bit. So what you were talking about, like what about those other beams? I'm going to show you something here in a second. Okay, um, Is everybody okay with this? Yes. Like what? Well, well... That's a good question. Well, I'm not really saying it's negligible. I'm saying that that load goes to the beam, and then that the reaction from the beam goes to the girder. So I'm not saying it's negligible. I'm just counting. I'm saying it goes to the beam, and then it goes back to the girder. The only load that I would superimpose on top of the girder that I hadn't dealt with before is the girder's self-weight. Because the girder itself is not going to be light as a feather. It might weigh four or 500 pounds per foot that, that the beam didn't have to deal with. Does that make sense? That's the only load that I'm not talking about right now, but we will deal with beam self-weight a little bit later. So, yes? So, if we go to deal with method one, then can't the beam be a constant division? Or could the column be a constant division? Yeah, let me do the column, and I think you'll see where I'm, where I'm coming from. Okay. See, I'm proposing that the column that there's two ways of doing it and you'll kind of get similar answers. Just, just bear with me, okay? Let's take a look at the column. 
Now, help me out. What is the tributary area of the column going to be? Here, I'll, I'll, I'll scroll up a little bit. Say it again. 50 times 30, so 1,500, right? So 50 feet, 50 foot times 30 foot. All right, that was, that's going to bug me if I don't fix that. So square foot, okay? So here's what I'm saying. One thing you can do if you want to figure out the load on the column, remember you got a column, it's going to have a load going down. How much is that load? Well, there, take uh, 20 pounds per square foot. I'm getting ahead of myself. 20 pounds per square foot and multiply it by the tributary area. What is that? Say it again. 30,000 pounds or 30 kips? That's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is this. It's to go back to, to what he was saying. If I look at a typical interior column, how many girders frame into a typical interior column? Two. How many beams frame into an uh, interior column? Two. So here's what I propose. One thing that you could do is you could say two beam reactions plus two girder reactions. But the girder reactions have to be the smaller one, have to be the 12 kips. So 2 times 3 kips plus 2 times 12 kips. And what does that equal? Thirty kips. So that's sort of alluding to I think what you were talking about is if you use the point load method you're not double counting load and that in the end when you look at the column it's going to see the same amount statically. Now let's be clear the, the, uh, uh, the if you were to transfer the other reaction you'd be double counting load a bit. Does that make sense? Okay, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so, so the girder is framing into the column. So think about, what, think about what happens. You have a column, right? And then you have a girder sitting on it, you know, sitting on that edge. It's, when it's sitting on it, it's holding it up. It, it's seeing a force, right? I mean, think about it like this. Let's say that you two were standing apart and you were holding, like, this table, right? So you were on this end, I was on this end, we were holding this table. How do you do that? Well, you pick it up, right? So your hands are seeing a reaction. That's what they're seeing, right? The table weighs 20 pounds per foot over a distance of five feet. I'm making this up, so it's 100 pounds. So you are each lifting up 50 pounds. That, that's how it works. So if you're the column, you have to support 50 pounds. Does that make sense? Everybody else okay with this? Everybody good? Any questions? Now, the only thing I'll mention is that this thing, that's 30,000 pounds, but that's only 30,000 pounds on one story, right? What if this was a five-story building? How much would the column see at the bottom? What's that? 150, right? Because, let think, the column is seeing 30 kips per story. If it's a five-story building, it's seeing 150 kips. Does that make sense? I think that's only 20 pounds per square foot. That's not very much. That's, I, I always just thought that was kind of insane, just how much load that is. Okay. Any questions? All right. I do want to talk a little bit about where these loads come from. Yeah. Yeah, and, and what I'll say is this, I prefer the second method, the point loads. It's a little bit more work, but I think it adheres to the principles of statics a little bit better. Yeah. So, but you don't want to do, do like method one on the beams and then do method two on the 
Well, with the beams, there's really no other way to do it because there's no nothing framing into it. Sound good? All right. So let's try and let's try and, and move forward a little bit. So I just made up a number for this problem. I just said 20 pounds per square foot. Where the where the heck did I get 20 pounds per square foot? Well, in fact, that's a more general question. Where do you get loads in general? Okay. Well, loads come from specifications. Um, the, arguably one of the most common uh, uh, and, and popular or, or most cited uh, uh, load resources available is ASCE 7. ASCE is more than an organization that just uh, organizes a concrete canoe competition. They are the leading technical resource for civil engineers in the United States. I mean, they, they um, all, a lot of the design guidelines and philosophies that we use come from ASCE, so they manage a lot, of, uh, a lot of stuff on the technical side as well. And ASCE 7 outlines minimum design loads for buildings and other systems. Now, we're not going to use ASCE 7 directly, but I'm going to show you the provisions that I think are the most important uh, in ASCE. Now, um, I'm going to talk about loads individually, like because in, in structural engineering, that's sort of how we handle it nowadays. We don't just say, here's all the load on the beam. Uh, we handle each load separately. Like we look at dead loads by themselves. We look at live loads by themselves. We look at snow loads by themselves. And the reason why is because each load event has with it its own degree of uncertainty. For instance, let's take live loads. Live loads uh, are essentially loads related to occupancy, what the building is being used for. Now, we are a live load in this room right now. Well, what's going to happen at 11 o'clock? There's going to be another class come in here, a very full classroom, right? Um, well, think, that's a different live load. Live load has more variation than dead load. So it stands to reason that the load factors that we use for live loads are higher than they are for dead loads because there's more uncertainty. So it makes sense to handle each load separately. So I want to talk about each of these loads and, and how they're characterized. I'm going to start with dead loads. Now, dead loads consist of essentially the structure's self-weight. It's, it's, it's its own self-weight. This building is not uh, you know, light as a feather. It has significant weight to it. It has structural steel and reinforced concrete. Structural steel and reinforced concrete are not light materials. They're very heavy. Um, I would argue that if there's of you know, any numbers, you know, quantities that I think you need to memorize as civil engineers, these two are pretty good ones. It's like, what's the gamma for water? It's, it's, well, we either SI or US, I don't, we don't use SI in here, come on now. Um, 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, right? Or whatever it is in SI, uh, SI, we don't use SI in here. But um, that's a very common material and understanding its properties are very important. Structural steel and reinforced concrete are also very important materials. Uh, our, unless otherwise noted, we typically assume that the unit weight of reinforced concrete is 150 pounds per cubic foot. For structural steel, it's 490 pounds per cubic foot. These are, uh, especially with steel, that's a number you can set your watch by. Um, if you are designing a building um, and you know you need to know dead loads, you can either look, uh, you know, refer to the manufacturers or look up loads in ASC 7. For instance, if I'm designing this building, I need to know how much the drop ceiling weighs. I need to know how much the carpet weighs. I need to know how much to account for MEP, for mechanical, electrical, and plumbing allowance. So all, all of those components add weight to the building. And so I could contact the manufacturer from some of those, or I could refer to ASC 7. And basically, it's just got tables and tables of loads, and then those loads are expressed in PSF. So for instance, if I'm looking at suspended ceiling, suspended ceiling is typically around two pounds per square foot. If I'm looking at um, uh, uh, fireproofing, you know, uh, for, for roof loads, that's typically around two pounds per square foot. Um, rigid insulation is usually about uh, one and a half pounds per square foot per inch of thickness. So, you know, you can uh, determine this stuff pretty easily. Um, one other thing that, that, uh, that is a significant component to, uh, uh, dead, or to self weight or to dead loads is self weight. And I want to look at beam self-weight because this is a very uh, common uh, calculation that we're going to do in this course. So let's say I have a beam, all right? It is B wide, it's H tall, and it's L long. So what's the volume of that beam? There we go. And so if I take the volume of that beam and I multiply it by the gamma, would you agree that I have the total weight of that beam? Right? Now, 
for structural analysis land, we don't typically lump that as just a single load right in the middle of that beam. That load is spread out over the length, right? So we typically treat it as a uniformly distributed load. So how do you determine the uniformly distributed load? Well, I would take this entire load and divide it by the length. Well, if I take this formula and divide it by the length, I'm going to have gamma times BH. Well, what is BH? That's the area, right? Samurai sword or lightsaber. Remember those secret weapons of structural engineering, right? So if I samurai sword or lightsaber through the beam, that beam has an area. If I take that area and I multiply it by the unit weight, that tells me how much that beam weighs per foot. So if I take gamma times the area and I get 500 pounds per foot, that beam weighs 500 pounds per foot. Everybody okay with that? Okay, any questions? All right. I want to talk a little bit about live loads. We're going to get into the specifics of live loads on Friday, but I do kind of want to mention it. So live loads, um, I, live loads is sort of a shorthand. I, I kind of like that term, but really when I'm talking about live loads, what I'm talking about is occupancy what the structure is being used for, okay? So we are a live load acting on this classroom, so the live loads for a classroom are going to be different than the live loads for a hospital or a theater or an office building or what have you. Um, and again, these are specified in, in, in things like ASC 7. So for instance, if you're designing, let's say, an office building, okay, the offices themselves are typically designed uh, for 50 pounds per square foot. Uh, the hallways above the first floor are typically designed for 80 pounds per square foot. Uh, the lobbies and the first floor corridors are designed for 100 pounds per square foot. See, one of the, the tricks that structural engineers use and developers use, have you ever been in a commercial office building, you know, multi-story, got cubicles and stuff everywhere, everybody been in one of those? Well, when you're the developer and you're the person who is uh, trying to sell that office space to, you know, some insurance company or to an engineering firm or what have you, um, if you're the person uh, doing that, you want that building to be as versatile as possible. You want them to be able to wall it off and, you know, use it to their heart's content. So a lot of, thing, a lot of times what structural engineers will do is they will design the entire floor system as if it was one big hallway. And so they'll put 80 pounds per square foot everywhere. And they'll say, well, you can just put up the cubicles wherever you want. You know, it's not like, you know, this has to be the hallway and this has to be the, the, the offices. See, it's not the same as if you were designing, let's say, a hotel. I mean, have you ever been in a hotel and the rooms move around? Unless it was, you know, a hotel that Stephen King wrote about. Um, no, the rooms are where the rooms are and the hallways are where the hallways are. So you can divvy it up and you can say, no, this has 50 pounds per square foot, this has 80, or, or, et cetera. Sound good? Now... That by itself would be pretty simple, but there's a little bit of a problem. You know, I, I, when I was first learning this, you know, somebody said, well, the load is 50 pounds per square foot. I, what, what's 50 pounds per square foot? I, I couldn't visualize that in my brain. What exactly does 50 pounds per square foot look like, okay, if we're talking about people? This is a six by six uh, square. This, these images actually come off the pedestrian bridge specification. And that's what 50 pounds per square foot looks like. Okay, it's about 12 people in a 6 by 6 square. Okay, that is what 100 pounds per square foot looked like. That's what 150 pounds per square foot looks like. That's, that, so it, I want you to kind of get a kind of an idea of what this means, you know, what it actually looks like. Okay, so here's my question. What's the probability that these design loads will be applied over an entire floor area all the time? The, the answer is not likely. So to give you kind of an example, for a typical classroom in this building, uh, I did the math, and if we were looking at 40 pounds per square foot, which is a typical classroom load, uh, that would be about 100 people. Have you ever been in a classroom in this building of this size, and there's been 100 people in here? No, I know. I know. But we're not there, right? So, um, the, so the answer is, do, do we use those loads directly out of ASC? The answer is no. What we do is we reduce those loads to account for this reduced probability of full loading. We are going to talk about live load reduction on Friday. That's all I've got. I would say I'll see you on Friday, but I think most of you I'm going to see you here in a couple minutes. That's all I've got.